private pre-shared key, effortless Wi-Fi security. Um, during the webinar session today, David Coleman, who is our Director of Product Marketing, is going to cover a few uh, topics, um, which will include how this technology blends ease of deployment and use with robust enterprise security, why our customers love PPSK and use it as part of a multi-layer Wi-Fi security strategy, and why our cloud ecosystem makes it so easy to onboard BYOD and IoT use cases. Um, before I hand it over to David, I'm just going to go over a couple quick housekeeping items. Um, everyone is in listen-only mode, so any questions you have, just submit them in the Q&A box, and we'll be sure to answer those either at the end of today's call or we'll follow up with you after if we don't have time. And this webinar will be recorded and available on demand within the next 24 hours to you. Uh, so with that, uh, David, you can take it away. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for attending uh, this uh, webinar about private pre-shared key, which is uh, one of my favorite uh, capabilities uh, here at Extreme Networks. Um, if you don't know who I am, uh, I am Extreme Networks Director of Product Marketing. Uh, I'm Certified Wireless Network Expert number four. Uh, there's my Twitter address, at Mr. Multipath. I, uh, Hope I'm always looking for more Twitter followers. A lot of people always laugh at me about that, but uh, the Wi-Fi community is extremely active on Twitter and we actually share a lot of information with each other so you can learn a lot. And so I'm um, always looking for more followers and uh, I encourage you to participate as well. Um, I'm also the uh, co-author of this big fat book about wireless security called the Certified Wireless Security Professional Study Guide. Um, it's a book about how uh, it's, it's a book about robust and enterprise wireless security. It is a study guide. It is vendor neutral. It's not an extreme book, but um, it's um, yeah, the reason um, you know I'm mentioning this book is because we're talking about wireless security. And when we talk about wireless security, I'm going to kind of talk about why our customers love this. PPSK solution I'm going to talk about as part of a multi-layered Wi-Fi security strategy along with 802.1x. So one thing I want to make perfectly clear right away is that uh, 802.1x is by far the most secure uh, method of uh, Wi-Fi security, but uh, PPSK can also be used uh, as a multi-layered approach, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And then, uh, of course, a big part of this is I'm going to get into how Extreme Network's Cloud IQ system that you actually see in back of me here um, is uh, we've made a whole ecosystem that makes it easy to onboard BYOD and IoT uh, devices um, and then providing encrypted guest access private pre-shared key security solution. So with that, let's go ahead and jump straight into this. All right, so let's talk about security in general. So if you think of WPA2, there's basically two kinds of security. There's uh, WPA2 personal and also enterprise. Personal means static PSK security, uh, pre-shared key. Now, this is probably what you use at home, okay? Um, it's a, simply a static passphrase. It's eight to 63 characters, um, but it was never intended to be used in the enterprise. However, guess what? Lots of enterprises use this level of security, even though they really shouldn't be. Um, uh, it was not meant, it was meant to be a, uh, uh, to use for home security, quite frankly, because it's easy to just to type in a passphrase. The problem why it's not uh, a good idea for the enterprise is it is susceptible to what are known as brute force offline dictionary attacks. Um, you can mitigate that pretty easily, um, if you have a very strong passphrase. So the Wi-Fi Alliance recommends 20 uh, strong characters or more alphanumeric mixed case. If you do that, the odds of somebody cracking your passphrase um, are slim to none. There's nothing's impossible, but um, if you have a strong passphrase that uh, will uh, help mitigate that. But the bigger problem is this. The problem is that it's static, okay? It's a static passphrase. So that means all devices share the same credential. So let's talk about why that's bad um, for a couple of reasons. Now, if you use this in the enterprise, all your users and your devices share the same pa static passphrase. That might be easy to administer, but 
uh, you're highly susceptible to number one, social engineering attacks. So if I find out somebody is using a static passphrase at their company, I guarantee you I will get that passphrase out of somebody in about five minutes, okay? And if there's more than 10 people that have it, I'll just trick them into giving it to me or just ask them half the time to will they give it or just look on the post-it note on their computer. Um, bottom line is if it's compromised via social engineering or if a user leaves or the device is lost, for security reason, as a, an administrator, you're going to have to change the passphrase on all your APs and all your devices. Now, on all your APs, that's actually with our cloud management, very simple. It's just a quick Delta update and boom, it changes everything. But once again, that'll be a disruption of service. And more importantly, do you want to be the admin that has to go reconfigure, say, a thousand uh, client devices for your your um, solution, I don't think so. So, so it, it doesn't scale in the enterprise as well as the fact that it has security problems in the enterprise. Um, uh, another problem with static passphrase in the enterprise is basically you're tying it to what we call one single user profile so in, our, in our management system. And this is true for everybody, really, um, all vendors. And what that means is if you have a static passphrase every type with single SSID, um, all um, users and devices are just tied to the same user access policies, meaning they all have to go in the same VLAN and they're all gonna have the same firewall policy applied at the edge of the network. Um, so there's no way of having uh, different higher layer access policies uh, for different groups of users on the same SSID when you're using static passphrase. Now, that is why 802.1x is by far the method that you're normally going to be using for um, uh, security in the enterprise. So 802.1x is a port-based access control solution. Like I said, I wrote a whole book on it. Um, it, um, it uses e-authentication, it uses uh, uh, certificates, um, but the, the main thing to, to understand about it, that, that the along with the tunneled authentication that it provides is that all users have unique credentials. So that's two things. Number one, that provides unique authentication visibility with whatever your management platform is, okay? Which you don't get with a static passphrase. Secondly, um, if a user leaves or uh, the device is lost, the credential is simply changed for that one user in your LDAP database. Okay, so, and, and you're done, okay? So you don't have to reconfigure your APs. You don't have to reconfigure all your devices. Whatever device is compromised, you just deal with that one device and you move on. So, um, you know, we could have a whole three hour webinar just on how 802.1x works. Uh, it's fantastic, it's wonderful. Uh, however, um, uh, oh, and actually here's another advantage of 802.1x before I, uh, move on is the fact that you can leverage radius attributes and by leveraging radius attributes you can assign different user access policies um, to different groups of users all while on the same ssid so you can have a um during 802.1x authentication maybe you have uh the marketing group uh is assigned to one very specific uh ad group and those users, uh, when they authenticate, a radius attribute is sent down to the AP. Not only do they get access to the network, but they're dumped into VLAN 10 and with a very specific firewall policy. Built into every um, extreme cloud AP is a fully stateful layer two through layer seven firewall. So you can actually do the policy enforcement right there at the edge of the network. But then you could have the sales team and then the sales team's in a different AD group. And then you would simply leverage a different radius attribute um, to assign that group into different VLANs and firewall policies and on and on and on. You can actually do this to up to 63 different groups of, of users all in a single SSID. This is wonderful because it consolidates your uh, SSIDs and uh, minimizes your layer two uh, uh, management traffic in the air. But more importantly, it gives you the different access policies all in the same a wireless security solution. And, and this is nothing new, but every vendor can do this. And this is a wonderful thing. Can't do this with a static uh, PSK. Now, 802.1x, as I said, is by far the most uh, secure authentication method and it's everybody should be using it. However, 
And it, like I said, it is ideal for the enterprise because every user has those unique credentials. However, there are some drawbacks and it is that it's complex. So it involves certificates and a PKI. And the hardest part about 802.1x is how you can securely onboard the server side certificates onto the clients. And it's even harder if you're dealing with client side certificates, if you're doing EAP TLS. So I'm not saying it's can't be done. It can absolutely be done, but it's a lot of work involved. So it can be difficult to, be, to deploy and it can also be difficult to troubleshoot. Now I will say this in Extreme Cloud IQ, we have all kinds of wonderful 802.1x troubleshooting tools that can pinpoint right during the 802.1x pro process where, where there might be a failure, but there are literally like 20 or 30 different things that can go wrong if you don't have your 802.1x solution uh, properly configured. So it, it can be complex. That's all I'm saying. But I'm not saying don't use it. I'm just saying it's, it, it is, you got to know what you're doing. And it also, I'll make the argument, you got to have people on your staff that have the proper skill sets to deploy and troubleshoot it. Now, with that being said, that's why um, something we developed when I was at Arrowhive and is now part of the Extreme family, and it's been around now for about 10 years, is something called private pre-shared key. And it has been a huge winner for us because our customers and our partners love it. Um, it has a lot of the same benefits as 802.1x, but without the same complexity um, and, administra and administration that is required with 802.1x. All users have unique credentials. And at the end of the day, this is PSK security, okay? But bottom line is everybody has a unique one. And um, so if once, much like 802.1x, if a user leaves or a device is lost, you simply replace that single PPSK credential for that one user or device. Same thing with a social engineering attack. Maybe I trick user one into giving me their passphrase. Well, guess what? I'll be able to get onto the network, which that would be bad. Um, so you'd want to compromise. So you'd want to revoke that, revoke that really quick. Um, but um, I wouldn't, and I'd be actually even be able to decrypt that one user's traffic, but not anybody else's. So bottom line, it is. Um, uh, still susceptible to social engineering, just like a static PSK or or loss, but just like 802.1x, you can revoke the credential and replace it with a new one and uh, solve that problem. Now, um, the other thing is anything that you can do with 802.1x in terms of access control and leveraging radius attributes, you can absolutely do with our solution as well. This is one thing that kind of differentiates us with some of our uh, copycat competitors um, is the fact that we can link different user access policies to a single PPSK SSID. So not only do they get unique credentials, we can also dump different types of groups of users into different VLANs and different firewall policies and bandwidth policies and QoS policies. Like I said, anything you can do in terms of leveraging radius attributes for access control, post authentication, anything you can do with Enter2.1x, we can absolutely do with private pre-shared key as well. And that's a happy day. So let's talk a little bit more uh, about private pre-shared key. So private pre-shared key, basically what it is, it's multiple per user, per device PSKs uh, assigned to a single uh, SSID. And as you can see right here, this is actually some PPSKs at my house on different devices, okay? Um, so this type of security I'm actually using uh, at home right now, but, it, um, but it's used quite a bit in the enterprise. So we're gonna go over some um, uh, use cases for it in the enterprise. Um, here are the advantages. Um, there's no need for PKI certificates or radio servers. Once again, I'm not saying don't use 802.1x. As a matter of fact, we'll talk more about this. The bulk of our customers use 802.1x and private pre-shared key for very specific use cases. But the bottom line is you don't have that uh, administrative and deployment hassle. No need for a PKI, there's no certificates and no radius servers. It's a pre-shared key, it's a passphrase. Okay, so it's easy to deploy, much easier than 802.1x, and it's easy to troubleshoot. So if something goes wrong, you know, unlike the 32 things that can go wrong with 802.1x, with PPSK, there's basically one thing that can go wrong. They type it in wrong, okay? 
Um, and that's real easy to see because if you see a process called the four-way handshake fail, you know it's failed. Um, we have a, tr a, a tool called Client Monitor in our cloud that automatically tells you that basically sends an alert and says, this PPSK user is typing in their, um, their, um, their PSK wrong. So and that's it. It's very, so you can, and that's a 27 four, seven monitoring capability. Most importantly, it solves the static problem. Okay. So even if you do have a social engineering attack, um, you only have to worry about that replacing that one client and, um, and, or if somebody leaves or an employee gets fired or something like that, you don't have to replace um, and reconfigure all the APs and all the devices. You just can reconfigure the one single device. Okay, so here's another point that I think a lot of people don't understand about the solution, including some of the, my own people here at Extreme, is PPSK, because it's unique credentials, it also provides unique, what I like to call authentication identity meaning visibility. So if you're using a, any kind of static credential, for, I don't care what type of security solution you're using, but if you're using a static credential, if it's shared by multiple devices, all those devices have the same credential, how do you know which one is what? You don't have, the only way you can, on a Wi-Fi side of things is uh, differentiate between them would be to look at the MAC address and that's no fun. And nowadays MAC addresses are, MAC addresses A can be very easily spoofed. And secondly, um, now we have all the MAC randomization that we're having to deal with with iOS and Android devices. So you got to have some sort of authentication identity uh, to provide uh, visibility. And the best way to see visibility is a cloud management solution like Extreme Cloud IQ. So right here, you're actually seeing uh, a PPSK credential that is actually being used by three different devices. So right here, um, you see my iMac right here, and um, uh, um, I can. I, it has a very unique PPSK credential, but and then I have an iPhone that has a different PPSK credential. Okay. Um, now there's different ways you can do this. You can still share a PPSK among the three devices. I actually misspoke there. Um, I think these three devices are sharing the same PPSK, but you can actually also have um, different devices with um, different PPSKs. So it's totally up to you how you want to do this. If you have a user that has three devices, you can give them a unique PPSK for each device, or they can share that PPSK for a, a number of devices, but you gotta have that unique visibility by having the unique authentication credential. You can also restrict this. So we have a way of restricting this, um, the maximum amount of devices that can connect with a single PPSK credential. So maybe um, you wanna lock it down to one. Maybe you only say, you can only use the, uh, PPSK with one device, you could. But in the kind of the world we live in, most people might have three or four devices. It might be, you'd be better advised to allow them to have three or four devices to connect. It depends on your security policies and what you're trying to protect. Bottom line is we give you a lot of options on how you want to manage this, um, much like 802.1x, but so much simpler to um, deploy and to troubleshoot. Um, these can also be time-based credentials, PPSK. So um, they can, meaning they can be revoked at any time. And when they're actually created, you can, you have a lot of options. So you could create PPSK credentials for a single user or a group of users that is set for a very specific time period. So in this case, from today, December 3rd to Christmas day, and then you could hand out that credential. And then on Christmas day, that PPSK expires, that private pre-shared key expires. Now there's other ways of doing it as well. We have multiple ways. Here's another way. This is one of the most popular ways. It's, it's used a lot for guest access. You can say, I'm gonna give you a PPSK. In this case, I'm gonna give you an authentication credential that's good for 24 hours. Now it won't be activated until first login, meaning, and, but you only have seven days to, to activate this. So what this means is if I handed you a private pre-shared key credential at today, but you didn't activate it and try to connect to it till 8 p.m. this evening, it would be good in this case till 8 p.m. tomorrow evening. 
That being said, in this example, um, you have seven days to activate it. So what you wouldn't want to do is say, okay, here's your 24 hour access key, but uh, then that person comes back and uh, uh, six months later and tries to get on. So as you can see, we have a lot of different ways. You can also give them um, uh, ways to renew it. Um, so there's, we can do things like um, the user can be given an option to renew it and when it expires, and you don't have to do this, but when it say it expires in 24 hours, when they try to uh, reconnect, a captive web portal can pop up and they will be given the opportunity um, to uh, re renew their PPSK, if that's what you choose, how you choose to do it um, for another 24 hours or 48, 48 hours or, or whatever you wanna do it. The good news is you can set all kinds of different time periods too. So much like you can have different access policies and dump different groups of users into different um, uh, VLANs and firewall policies, you can have different groups of users with different time-based policies. So on one SSID, you can have one group of users that gets 24-hour keys and another group of users that gets uh, keys that are good for a week, or you can also make them persistent. You can give them private pre-shared key authentication credentials that never expire. So it's totally totally up to you how you want to do it in terms of the expiration and the, the availability of these private pre-shared keys, authentication credentials. Once again, I cannot stress how much the, uh, the uh, authentication identity and visibility is important as well. Now, um, how do you do onboarding? Well, um, we have a lot of different ways. As I mentioned, these can be time-based, but um, you can, bottom line is, these PPSKs can be distributed and onboarded in a lot of different ways. So once they're created in the management system, um, cloud management system, uh, they can be sent to a uh, end user, either by an SMS message, um, or they can be sent uh, by an email or uh, by a printed receipt. And by the way, all these are cust fully customizable too. So that email can be customized with your company's logo, if you'd like. Uh, even the SMS message can be customized to a certain extent. There's only an X amount of characters that are available, but you can customize that uh, as well, and as, as well as any kind of printed receipt. Um, so, um, and then once they put it in, it's theirs. Um, we also, you're gonna see have uh, self-service key, um, there are availabilities through third parties of self-service kiosk and applications that can be used to do the onboarding depending on your use case. And that's what we're getting ready to get into here in just a few minutes. Uh, also, this whole solution can be tied into employee sponsorship as well. So it's the kind of thing where you could have uh, some kind of thing where uh, uh, either app or um, SSID, captive web portal, where somebody registers um, and it contacts uh, one of your employees. Your employee gets a message that says, uh, uh, Bob is here at the front desk, wants to get on the guest network, is he allowed? And then Bob, and then when the employee gets that email message, they click it and that'll immediately do basically a change of authorization that uh, then uh, will uh, allow that user onto the guest network via our PPSK authentication uh, solution. Um, the big thing about this is we have a full-blown API built around this. We call them the identity APIs because I go back once again that this isn't just about uh, encryption and, and, and authentication, it's about visibility, authentication identity. And that's one of the reasons we call them the identity APIs. So you can build your own apps. We have a lot of customers that have built uh, apps for uh, uh, Androids, iOS, and a lot of web applications, actually. We have a lot of higher ed customers that built their own custom web applications for to onboard the PPSK uh, credentials. Um, you can see right here, it can be delivered uh, on the app in this case. Uh, and there's even ways where the PPSK credentials and the SSID can be tied into a QR code. And then you just take your phone and you scan that QR code and it basically installs the whole Wi-Fi profile um, onto your phone with the PP, the unique authentication credential as well as the SSID. So it's pretty slick actually. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, our identity APIs uh, have been used a lot of different ways. One example here 
is there's a company in the Netherlands called um, um, that makes something called the PPSK kiosk. Um, and uh, they've made their own app and they actually make this kiosk and they can customize it for your organization as well. This is used a lot in lobbies and, and things like that, um, um, where basically it's a self, it's a self-service um, uh, PPSK Wi-Fi security um, using this kiosk and this app. And uh, uh, it's very, very popular. And this particular company has done quite well selling these. So I encourage you to check them out. And they've just built something on their own using our identity APIs. So let's get into the use cases. And this is my favorite part because in, in my mind, there's three big use cases. Our customers are always finding more, but here's the three big ones. Guest access provides guest users with unique secure credentials. I'll get more into each one of these in separate slides. BYOD, this is an outstanding BYOD solution, especially for um, customers that'll use 802.1x for their company issued devices, but for their BYOD solution, when employees bring in their own devices, they use private pre-shared key with, uh, and once again, unique and secure credentials. And the probably the most underrated one that is just uh, awesome sauce is IoT devices, because a lot of IoT devices simply don't have 802.1x capability, and you can provide unique and secure credentials and identity, um, authentication identity for IoT devices. So let's talk more about each one of these. Um, number one, I like to always, I learned a long time ago, you know, it's interesting, back when I was self-employed, um, I used to do contract work for a company called Air Defense. Um, they had best breed whip solution. And uh, interestingly enough, you're looking at it right here. It's now part of the extreme portfolio and, and being built into our cloud management solution. So I'm very excited about that. But I learned from them a long, long time ago, 20 years ago or 18 years ago, that um, the bad guys are always open, are always lurking at the public access and open guest networks that, because it's low hanging fruit. So if you go to start, not to pick on Starbucks or anybody like that, but you know, any place you go, they have open SSIDs, right? There's no encryption, okay? And, and so you are open for a whole host of attacks. Um, I could name five right off the bat, but that's where the bad guys are. Um, the good news, PPSK, if you use that for your guest access solution, you're doing a lot of different things. You're giving unique authentication credentials instead of just asking them to log in through a captive web portal, uh, your um, which can still be done as well, but you don't have to. The credential is not the, a captive pet portal login, the credential is the PPSK, okay? So that provides the unique identity for your guest access that can be tracked. Okay, and, visual, and, and visualized. Secondly, and here's the cool thing, encryption. You have encrypted guest access and data privacy for your, your guests. So it provides that visibility for tracking the guests, but the encryption is a value added service for your guest Wi-Fi users. And this is one of the, really one of the first use cases we figured out a long time ago for this. And a lot of our customers love is they provide a much better means and secure means of guest access. They get that unique authentication visibility and it's providing a little bit of extra serve, uh, security for their guests and keep them away from uh, the hackers. Now, the one that we didn't see coming years ago, but our customers figured out right away uh, and is just as big as a use case is BYOD. So as I mentioned, we'll have a lot of customers that'll use 802.1x as your, their primary security solution. Uh, and they're using that um, primary security solution uh, for you know, their own device, for the company issued devices, the laptops and, and, so, and so forth. Um, and maybe you know, company issued tablets, things of that nature. But we live in a BYOD world. We all know that employees like to bring their own devices in, they bring their own iPhone or iPads in with expectations of being to, able to access the um, corporate network with their own devices. Now that provides all kinds of challenges for administrators, especially with 802.1x 
and getting a certificate on one of these things that's not company owned. It's not an easy thing to do unless you have an MDM solution. So um, what we found is a lot of our customers will use PPSK as their BYOD solution. And it is very simple because they'll still use 802.1x for the company issued devices, but they allow their own employees to self-service on board unique PPSK credentials onto their own devices and they can slap them off into a different VLAN and very often it'll 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 be a different SSID with a different VLAN and different policies. Um, but bottom line is you're not tying up your administration but you still have that unique you still have authentication and unique uh, authentication credentials. Um, this we've had partners and companies like this company Yflex that have built um, apps and solutions that are back-end systems that can enter, um, that can even assist customers for their employee BYOD solutions. So Yflex builds a back-end solution where uh, their customer, um, any company can divine access based on security groups in either Microsoft Azure, um, um, uh, uh, in, this, in either Google, um, uh, workspace or Microsoft Azure uh, 365. So then the backend database application that they've designed is tied to a customer's backend, uh, either Google or, uh, or Office 360 LDAP database. And then it's linked to our cloud PPSK solution. So as a customer just kind of links those together, they link together the user groups with whatever security groups that you have in either Office 365 or Google Workspace. And then, one problem with my slides, there we go. Um, when an employee logs in, uh, they'll actually connect to an open, this whole self-service process is simple for self-service BYOD aborting. They connect to an open SSID one time and one time only. Uh, that captive web portal is tied back into the employee logins with Google G Suite or Office 360 credentials. They're verified. And then once they're verified, they're issued a, a very secure PPSK that is unique to them. And um, they can, once again, scan it with a QR code, boom, done. That installs the SSID profile as well as the PPSK credential onto their device. And they are, boom, they, are, they then connect to a secure uh, and private um, uh, SSID that is meant for BYOD security. Uh, and in the meantime, they still have the 802.1x SSID for all the other corporate devices. This is a huge use case. Um, so I, I mentioned encrypted guest access and also BYOD um, for PPSK are two of the top use cases that have been used quite a long time by uh, Arrowhive customers. And as you can see, we also have partners that are leveraging our API capabilities to build uh, backend solutions. Now, one of the things I, I've been like to say lately is that IoT is a new security frontier. Now, we hear I, the buzzword IoT all the time, but if you look at the numbers exponentially, IoT device growth is growing like this. Now, not everything, every IoT device has Wi-Fi in it, obviously, but Wi-Fi is in a lot of IoT devices, okay? So all those Wi-Fi IoT devices are potential entry points into your network. And the problem is, a lot of them aren't, most of them aren't secure very well. A lot of them have, don't even support 802.1x. And if they do support 802.1x, it's uh, very hard to get the um, <coughs> certificates onboarded onto them, okay? Um, so it's very hard to provision those certificates on IoT devices. And as I said, a lot of them don't even uh, support 802.1x. Uh, so I actually talked to a buddy of mine who works for a healthcare uh, uh, manufacturer of healthcare medical devices. Um, and he did a little bit of research and he said in, in hospitals, like 65, 70% of the medical devices and patient monitoring equipment still using static PSK security. And so to me, that's, that's unbelievable because if you think about that, number one, now, hopefully that, that's changing, but uh, number one, um, uh, it's not as secure a solution as 802.1x, but uh, number two, if you're using a static PSK, um, 
all it takes is one of those getting hacked and now you're hacking into all those devices. Now you're talking about mission critical stuff here. I'm just using this one vertical. Um, IoT devices are in lots of verticals, warehousing and on and on and on. But the, the, what I'm getting at is this, PPSK is a beautiful solution for IoT. Okay, you don't have to deal with the certificates um, and uh, you can give each unique P uh, IoT device its own secure credential. And then once again, you get that unique authentication visibility in the cloud. And if one device gets compromised, you just fix that one device. You don't have to uh, reconfigure your entire hospital. So to me, of all the three use cases, this is the most underused one. And I think the, the, the most growing one for our, our effortless wireless security solution, private uh, pre-shared key. Um, so it is a perfect solution for healthcare, a patient monitoring equipment. I want you to look at this slide right here. Look at all these different companies that make uh, uh, IoT devices and patient monitoring equipment. Um, there's a lot of them, okay? PPSK security, if these devices have Wi-Fi radios in them, and many of them do, okay? Um, PPSK is kind of a no-brainer. Um, so IoT and private pre sure key is your friend. As I mentioned, it's not just healthcare, it's many verticals. When you start talking to IoT, heck, it could be education. There's IoT devices in the class, IoT devices in the classroom. Um, I think a lot of times when we think of IoT, we think about the Nest thermostat like I showed earlier. And yeah, we have lots of those at home, but you need to understand that IoT devices are all over different verticals in the enterprise now as well, especially healthcare and also now manufacturing. Lots of sensor devices, uh, thermostat monitoring equipment, and uh, um, lots of, like I said, lots of sensors that have Wi-Fi radios in them. And this is a fantastic and simple way to easily onboard and secure uh, unique authentication credentials to each, uh, you know, robot or or sensor, and um, you know, and get that identity and visibility that can be tracked in the cloud. Uh, so let's talk about how it works. We actually have two different ways of doing PPSK. Uh, one we call it local PPSK, where you can actually upload all the credentials in advance and store them on the APs. Um, and that's and then you're done. Uh, that's done a lot with the IoT, okay? Uh, because those devices usually aren't mobile and uh, they're not changing. However, for the bulk of our solutions, especially the BYOD and the guest access, we have uh, a cloud uh, distribution method. It's all tied into our cloud ecosystem, Extreme Cloud IQ. So let's say, however, whatever onboarding solution you've used, that user already has been given their PPSK and they've installed it onto the, uh, this case their iPad. Okay, so. Um, they use one of those methods, you know, they got it by SMS or text or something, and they already have it, and they have it installed in their device. Now, when the device tries to talk to an extreme cloud AP for the first time, um, it needs to be verified. So that AP um, doesn't have the PPSK credential on it yet. So what it'll do is that it will contact uh, another AP on the same management subnet, which is known as a RADSAC proxy, a proxy AP. And the RADSAC proxy AP does a quick call out to the cloud um, and using the RADSAC protocol, which uses a, a TLS encryption. So it's all secure. And it's basically going, yo, Extreme Cloud IQ, this user, uh, she would like to get on. Um, uh, is, are they even in the database? And uh, it, they will be verified very quickly that they are in the database, in the backend cloud database. And what the cloud does uh, is securely sends down what is known as the pairwise master key um, down the cloud. Once again, that's encrypted, so it can't be uh, uh, compromised over across the uh, internet. It's installed on that proxy AP. And then we use uh, a proprietary protocol where all our APs talk to each other um, using uh, cooperative control. Um, and basically that master key is shared with all the, what are known as neighbor APs. And now that master AP, not only has the user been verified, that master A key, map pairwise master key has been distributed across all the APs, uh, which is important if a user has to roam. 
But bottom line, we're ready to go here. And the last step is client does a four-way handshake uh, and sets up their final, what are known as pairwise transient keys, which are the actual unicast keys that are used to encrypt the user traffic. And because that master key is on every other AP, all the neighbor APs, that client can roam securely as well. So basically the query to the cloud only happens that one time. And then it is stored on all the APs. That master key is stored on all, all the APs. Um, so once, and, and voila, you have instant access. So that was fun. So one question, and I, uh, I'll, we'll open it up for Q&A here in a minute. But one question I get asked all the time is, well, how many pairwise master keys and how many PPSKs can you have? Um, really, your storage... Um, well, I, let's see if somebody asked the question, but I, I believe the storage is, uh, most of the storage is in the cloud. Um, and uh, um, I'll come back to that. Let's see if somebody asked that question about how many keys you can have on the AP. Um, now, um, that being said, uh, via the cloud and uh, via the uh, identity APIs, we have built an entire ecosystem around PPSK security. Uh, we take in currently one terabyte of data per second with all our customers, and it's growing exponentially. Uh, we take in more data than any other cloud provider, networking cloud provider out there, um, which allows us to do a lot of cool things in terms of machine learning and analytics, more and more and more, which we'll hear of in the future. Uh, but that being said, um, the uh, one thing I get asked all the time is, well, um, is about our competitors. So I'm gonna see if that question comes up as well. Uh, what I, I'm trying to say is we do have some competitors that have built some similar things, but we have built a whole ecosystem around, around this and it's tied uh, into our Extreme Cloud IQ uh, management solution. Uh, the, um, and because we've built an ecosystem around it, we, we're building things on top of it. So we'll do another session uh, later on about something called private client groups. But let me just give you a, a little teaser real quick. Private client groups is built on top of PPSK. Private client groups enables administrators to manage and control network services based on micro locations, such as assigned rooms, like in dormitory rooms or hotel rooms. So you hear a lot about micro segmentation in networking. This is a micro segmentation security solution. So this can work with any extreme cloud AP where we use it a lot is with um, our wall plate APs that are maybe installed in a dormitory room. And uh, it does utilize our private pre-shared key technology. It provides unique credentials and identity for your wireless users and devices. But uh, just to just kind of describe uh, uh, what it does, it provides this identity micro segmentation. So in other words, maybe you're a student and you're in a dorm room, you'll be able to connect to an SSID with your unique PPSK credential, but you will, all the wired networking assets, you will only be able, like maybe a printer or a Game Boy or something like that that is in that dorm room, only you will be able to access those. And even if you roam to other APs uh, in, a, in a residence hall, you'll still be able to access, um, connect to the same SSID on, in, on wall plate APs and other rooms, but, um, but you will be redirected back to your network resources only. And the beauty is, is nobody else has um, <clears throat> access to your network resources at all. And it completely prevents peer-to-peer -peer attacks, even though you're all on the same SSID. We leverage ACLs that are applied at the AP level. Um, and this is entirely built upon, um, it's called private client groups. It's actually become very popular. Uh, you'll be hearing more about it as we do other sessions, but it's built on top of our PPSK solution. So we can provide a, a unique PPSK identity and authentication solution along with micro segmentation and a lot of use cases for that. Dormitories, hotels, uh, assisted living facilities and on and on and on. Um, okay, a couple quick plugs here and then um, I will open it up for some questions. So, um, 
Uh, I mentioned I wrote a security book. Um, I also am the co-author with my buddy Dave Westcott of uh, this big fat book of just about Wi-Fi in general. It is getting ready to come out in its sixth edition. You can order it now. It should be available as early as I'm hoping late January or early February. It is once again a vendor neutral book and uh, it's not an extreme book, but uh, it's, uh, we're very proud of it. And if you're new to Wi-Fi or even if you're older to Wi-Fi, I promise you'll learn a lot in the 1000 plus pages. So that's my shameless plug there. Um, so with that, um, I'm gonna open the Q&A panel and uh, Kyle, if you can maybe feed me some of these questions as well, um, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I appreciate that, David. Um, so a lot of questions came in. Uh, we'll get to as many as possible. Um, first, one I'm going to present to you, David, is a two-part question. Um, first, uh, how does PPSK scale? And the second part to that is there a limitation on how many PPSKs uh, can be on an access point? Okay, good. I, I was hoping somebody would ask that. Um, I, I, um, so the answer is, if it's the cloud distribution of the PPSK, it's infinite, okay? Um, there's no limitations to the cloud. There is a limitation on the AP. And I know this might shock some people because it's kind of small. It's only 10,000. So I, I'm being facetious, but yes, you can have as many as 10,000 PPSKs stored on an AP, a single access point. But in the cloud, um, you could actually have um, create even more. So, but on at a single AP at a single site, 10,000. And I don't know of any manufacturer that actually has 10,000 connections at the same time. Awesome. Appreciate that. Um, another question that popped in, um, I think we'll want to answer now. Um, do customers abandon 802.1x for PPSK? We have some. Uh, believe it or not, we have some very large K through 12 school systems, and even a couple of large universities that use PPSK for everything. They use it for their employees, their guest access, and their BYOD solution. So uh, we have some very big universities um, that actually do that. But I, I want to emphasize again, I'm not saying that. I would say more uh, uh, than not, most of our customers use both. Okay. Um, a combination of the two. But yeah, sure. Um, uh, what we're not by any means saying replace 802.1x with PPSK. Um, usually corporate devices are in 802.1x, BYOD, guests, and IoT are in PPSK. Got it. Awesome. Um, the next one um, that we want to present here uh, Don't you have competitors that offer similar per user? PPSK solution? Yeah, so I started alluding to that uh, as well. So um, we've been doing this for over 10 years. And yeah, we do. And so I like to say imitation is the best form of flattery. Um, and so we have about another three competitors uh, that offer a, some sort of, they, they have their own marketing names for it, but they have something similar. Now, that being said, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, and this is just true. Most of them, every one of them created something as a direct, uh, pretty much a direct answer to us. Um, and so in a lot of cases, they just develop something. So if they go up against us in a potential deal, um, they, have, they can check that RFP um, checkbox or, um, quite, um, right away. Bottom line is, as I mentioned, we've built a whole ecosystem. We have a whole uh, API built around this. Uh, we have partners building integration into Google's uh, and uh, Microsoft 365 Azure. Um, we have the um, all kinds of onboarding apps and uh, kiosk solutions. And another thing where we're really different with the other guys is for the most part is we're the only one that offer the multiple out role access capabilities. So anything you can do with the radius servers uh, by leveraging radius att attributes with 802.1x, you can do with our PPSK solution. As a matter of fact, with one PPSK SSID, you can have 63 different groups of users be in 63 different VLANs and 63 different unique firewall policies if you wanna get that granular in your access control. And the other guys don't really do that uh, with their solution. Um, we've also tied the micro segmentation to ours, which is unique. 
um, to us. The other guys don't do that. And uh, I'm not going to mention the one competitor, but we have one competitor that has a, a, a PPSK solution, and it requires that you buy their very expensive NAC radius solution as well as an overlay. With our solution, it's just built into um, your standard cloud account. Awesome. Great. Appreciate that, David. A lot of other questions flowing in. We'll try and get to maybe yeah. a couple more. I don't know if you yeah. want to pick out specific. Yeah, um, um, let me just uh, kind of peruse them real quick. So I'm seeing is PPSK a standard? And the answer to that is no. Um, we developed this. Others have imitated it. And as I just got done saying, we do it better. Okay. Um, I... I'm not going to be able to get to all these. We'll definitely answer all these and somebody will follow up with you. Uh, does one need to know the MAC address prior to assigning the PPSK? The answer is no. Um, these are per device or per user. So no, you do not. Uh, with our local solution, though, you can tie the MAC address to the PPSK. There is a way of tying it together so that it, uh, only one MAC address can be used for that PPSK but you don't, need, you don't need to do that. Um, um, okay, um, can the keys be saved on the controller or propagated the APs? Well, we don't, this solution is not a controller-based solution. It's a distributed architecture. Um, so I'll repeat the question. Can the keys be saved on the controller and propagated to the access points? Um, bottom line is this isn't a controller-based solution. This is a distributed architecture solution. Uh, the, we have two ways of creating the keys. They can be created in the network management cloud platform and then pushed down to the APs um, for what is known as local storage in advance. But the more common method is the way I told you where they're created um, um, on the fly in the cloud. You don't have to create them in advance, they're created on the fly. And when that user, um, maybe I didn't do a good job of making that point, you can create these keys, especially like the guest access keys, you create them whenever you want. And then they're in the cloud. And when that user connects the first time, the APs query up to the cloud and then they grab their key. And then they're stored on the APs and up to 10,000. Um, is there a limitation to PPSKs to a, uh, an AP group? We do have what are called PPS groups, not AP groups. Uh, the limitation to the PPSK groups, and you can have as many as 63 of these tied is 1,000. Um, but, um, and you can have, uh, but the limitation of actual numbers of PPSKs is, is 10,000. So um, we've never had a problem in terms of scalability. Um, um, and the, uh, does the Wing series support PPSK? The answer to that is no, this is for the cloud APs, um, although Wing can be managed uh, along uh, with um, our, our solution. So I, I'm seeing a lot of questions about some of the legacy um, uh, ex extreme wireless solutions that are um, still supported uh, here at Extreme, the Wing and the Identify stuff, which by the way, can all be monitored and uh, and configured in Extreme Cloud IQ. Um, you know, never say never, but currently um, PPSK is specific to the cloud APs with the distributed architecture. Um, and is this a cloud solution or do you have an on-premises? Well, we have an on-premises cloud. So um, Extreme Cloud IQ can be, um, uh, that's one thing that we're kind of different from our competitors. We offer a lot of different ways of doing it. We have a cloud solution that can be on, on Microsoft Azure Cloud, it can be on Google Cloud, it can be on Amazon Cloud. We're the only company that does that. We all, we're the only company that provides unlimited data visibility in the cloud. If you want something more in your own data center, we have an on-premises solution. And we also, um, you'll be hearing more about some hybrid solutions that we have as well. They're um, uh, uh, multi-cloud and half cloud and, or uh, big scalable, almost like your own little data center, uh, um, a cloud solution. Um, so we have a lot of different ways of, of doing this um, in, in the cloud. Um, and once again, it's, uh, a lot of these questions are similar. Uh, does a special AP have to be purchased to grab the PPSK? Any of the, honestly, any of the cloud, man, the cloud access points. So a um, couple examples, uh, the AP305C, which is a dual five gigahertz, two by two by two. The AP410C, uh, which is, um, 
tri radio, uh, dual five gigahertz, and also tri radio, the AP 460 Cs. Um, any of the old Aerohive APs, all the older APs, all work with PPSKs, and any of the cloud APs manufactured forward um, all support PPSK. So that you have lots and lots of solutions that um, APs available to you uh, that can be managed in the cloud and support our private pre shared key solution. Um, that's a lot of questions. I know I didn't hit all of them, but I, I got to say, I really do appreciate the participation uh, with everybody. Um, and, um, and, you know, uh, we, for the ones that I did not get to, I promise you that we'll, we'll go through these and somebody will reach out to you and, uh, and answer each and every one of each and every one of these questions. Um, but with that, I encourage you to go to uh, extremecloudiq.com. Um, and if you don't have a cloud account, get a trial account, try it, contact your local, uh, um, or you can go to our website and you can even, uh, you know, get a hold of uh, an extreme employee that would love to do further demos for you. Um, and then the last thing I want to plug here, since I'm on it, you're going to be hearing a lot, what you're seeing in my background right here. Let me uh, stop my share real quick. And hopefully you just see me now. Um, you're seeing in my background right here is Extreme Cloud IQ, but I want to point something out here. We have something called Air Defense Essentials. So uh, we added this about a month ago, and one of the beauties about the cloud is you can take applications that are built on microservices and easily put them in the cloud. So a lot of the uh, really cool applications that have existed for a while here at Extreme are all being cloudified. And um, as of this speaking date, where I'm speaking right now, we're updating our RDCs with something called extreme guest essentials, extreme location essentials, and also extreme uh, IoT essentials. Three more applications that are all coming into here. And guess what? If you have a pilot subscription, your standard description, no extra costs. So it's a lot of our competitors that have these deep dive locationing solutions and guest management solutions, we're adding them in as an extra, we view that as an essential part of your network and we're adding them in um, into your uh, cloud management solution at no extra cost. So uh, stay tuned for that. You'll be uh, seeing a lot about that in the coming weeks and coming months. And I'm very excited about that air defense, extreme uh, location and extreme guests are all part of our portfolio. And, uh, and with that, um, uh, and yes, uh, air defense essentials, I just saw that question, is a part of uh, the pilot license. Um, and there will um, be further development in all these apps, but uh, check, them out, check them out. I think you'll be uh, um, very, very uh, impressed. That being said, I got a little off topic, but that's okay. We were here to talk about private pre-shared key, uh, effortless wireless security solution. Look, if you don't believe me, just ask any extreme customer or extreme partner that uses private pre shared key and they love it. Um, and it's for those three use cases I said, BYOD, IOT, and encrypted guest access. So I think we're right up against the hour. Um, so uh, Kyle, unless you have, you have anything else to add, I think I actually, for the first time ever, ended a webinar on time. <laughs> Awesome, that was great. Thanks uh, for all that, David. So yeah, uh, just like you said, we'll, we'll wrap for today. Again, anyone who didn't get their questions answered today will be following up with you directly. And uh, within the next 24 hours, we'll also be sending a link out um, to the recording, um, as well as a copy of the presentation today as well. So um, with that, thanks everyone for joining today. And we hope you have a great rest of your day.